Good morning, everyone. It is good to be in God's house this morning. I welcome you this morning, um, and I'm so glad to see each one of your smiling faces and to see the sunshine. But God's love is shining in this place, and it's really good to see every single one of you. Pastor Dave and Heather and the children have been on vacation all week, much deserved. They really, really need a break. And when he was talking about going, um, he actually contemplated coming home a day early so he wouldn't have to miss being with us on Sunday morning. And the Staff Parish Relations Committee said, no, 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 you need a rest. And so he's uh, very confident that we can praise the Lord this morning, whether he is here or not. And so um, we have a great church family with lots of giftedness here. And so we're just glad you're here, and we're just going to worship the Lord. So keep Pastor Dave and Heather and the children in your prayers. They are traveling back today from North Carolina. They've had a great time with his sisters reconnecting with family down there, being in the warmth and the sunshine. But um, we'll just keep them in our prayers as they travel. And um, I'm just grateful they could get away. We're going to read Hebrews 4 through 12, or verse 12, I'm sorry. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 12 through 16, and may God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Wayne, if you come up, I'll pray with you, if that's all right. All righty, Heavenly Father, Lord God, it's really good to be here, and Lord, I just know that you have worked in Wayne's heart and mind these past few weeks, and that you have laid a really special uh, message on his heart to share this morning, Lord. So I know this is not from him, but from you, and I just pray that our hearts and minds would be open to what you would have for each one of us this morning, and that we would leave this place refreshed and renewed and changed, having met you through your words this morning. I lift uh, Wayne up to you this morning, and I lift up this special time to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Um, You know, it's both a privilege and an honor to be asked to speak. And, you know, we have a pastor who does a wonderful job at that. Um, He usually starts out with some... uh, witticism of a anecdote about his family and something his children have done and something him and his wife are going through and everybody chuckles and laughs so go ahead and do that now so it'll it'll <laughs> there you go okay so we got through that part of it but you know as Barb said you know we have this pastor and he's a reverend Dr. David Cook and uh, every week he speaks to us and he has messages that are very impactful and and touch our lives and sometimes they speak directly to us and um, so often we take that for granted and I can tell you as somebody that's been asked to come up and stand behind this pulpit and fill his shoes those are big shoes to fill so God has laid a message on my heart 
and I'd like to share that with you today. But I do have a little story that God brought me as I sat there um, that's an anecdote of something that happened to me actually last night. Um, our grandbabies were over visiting, and um, my beautiful little grandbaby, Phoebe, wanted to go to the potty. She's five years old. And so she asked Papa to go in with her to the potty. And I did. And I said, well, why do you need me to come in? And she said, well, I'm scared of the monsters. And I said, oh, Phoebe, there's no monsters. Who told you there's monsters? Well, Toby, her little brother, told her there's monsters. So she was scared to go into the bathroom because there was monsters. And then she said something that really uh, hit hard in, into the bottom of my heart, both with joy and with shock and awe. She said, you know, Papa, Jesus is preparing a house for you and me right now. <laughs> and I said, yeah, he is. <laughs> and, and I thought, what joy it is to have the faith of a five-year-old, that pure, honest faith of just a little five-year-old. And it really is a, what's in this message that God has prepared today for us. Um, it's the foundation of it. And the title of the message is Returning to Your First Love. And I'd like to start by sharing some testimony about my life. Some of you know some of it, and some of you don't know me at all. But I'd just like to share some testimony. I was not raised in a Christian home. We didn't go to church, we didn't honor God, we didn't read the Bible, and we didn't pray. At age 13, I said a prayer and thought that that meant that I was saved, but I wasn't. In fact, I prayed right there. I didn't go to church, I didn't honor God, I didn't read the Bible, and I prayed like God was a genie in a, bi in a bottle. Do you know what I mean when I say that? You rub the bottle and you say, oh God, bail me out. Oh God, give me this, like a genie. That was my relationship that I thought I had with God, like he was a genie in a bottle. I lived a party lifestyle that started at age 14 and continued for all of what I call my BC days, before Christ. <laughs> at age 21, I married my first wife. At age 23, my son was born. At age 25, my daughter was born. Two years later, my wife abandoned both me and the kids. I became a single dad for 14 years. At age 39, I reached a very low place in my life, and I finally surrendered my life to Christ, for real. <laughs> I had a radical born-again experience I know some of you connect, can connect with that, and some maybe said a prayer when they were eight years old, and they didn't have quite an experience like I did, and some of you are maybe hoping to experience that one day, but I had a radical born-again experience, and with that was a radical transformation from where I lived in the world to where God wanted me to be. I was on fire for God. I served on several mission trips to Cuba, Guatemala, and Haiti. I led the youth group in this church for three years. I led several Bible studies. I started and led a men's group. I led a divorce recovery group for six years. I helped start the praise team, the praise band, and played in that for many years. And I actively evangelized and led many people to Christ. But, there's always that but, isn't there? <laughs> but, over time, I experienced some very difficult life circumstances. I failed to nurture my relationship with Christ, and I slowly drifted away. I slipped into a spiritual slump. Pastor Dave preached on that recently, about a spiritual slump. I found myself in one. Then recently, I lost some loved ones, including my father this past year. Um, and I began to question my faith. One of those loved ones was like a son to me. His name is Sean Foley. We were very close for over 20 years. He was a Marine Special Forces veteran of 19 years. 
He served on nine deployments and five combat tours. We spent many tearful hours on the phone over the years as he shared the haunting memories of the things he saw and did in war. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't think this would happen. <laughs> um, we talked about God many times, and he finally surrendered his life to Christ about four years ago. This past August, he shared that he was really struggling in some personal family issues and told me that he wanted to be born again. I reminded him, Sean, you are already born again. And he responded, I want to be born again, again. He wanted to feel like he did in the beginning once more. Nine days later at age 42, Sean suddenly was taken by the Lord. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I really didn't think this was gonna happen. Uh, it was a gut punch to me. I was shocked and it rocked the foundations of my faith. As I struggled to recover from the crushing blow, Sean's words, I want to be born again again, rang out over and over in my head. And it started me on a journey. The first step was trying to figure out the difference between when I first believed and where I was now, and facing the sobering question, what happened? <laughs> Author and pastor Chip Ingram says, we lose our first love when we embrace the world. I thought back desperately trying to remember what it was like when I first believed. What I remember was an overwhelming joy and peace and excitement, just knowing that no matter what, I was saved and would be with Jesus forever. I realized that in the beginning, God seemed so near, but over time and little by little, he seemed to be farther and farther away until one day I could barely feel him at all. I found it very difficult to stay in the word, to stay focused in Bible study, and even to pray. I felt spiritually weary and worn, becoming less and less effective, but still I pressed on serving others. Can anybody out there relate to what I'm saying? I began to realize that what I needed was a personal revival. So I started praying that God would revive me and show me what had happened to my faith and how to get back on track. The first thing I learned was that when you feel far from God, it's not because he's moved. And if he hasn't moved, then it must mean that you've moved. So this takes us to the first thing that God revealed to me is in Revelation 2, 1 through 5, and I'd like to read that through you to, to you. And it's a, what happened to the church in Ephesus. These are the, the words of Christ. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored in my name's sake and have not become weary. Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> Nevertheless, this I have against you, you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work. In this passage to the Ephesian church, they are being evaluated and praised by Christ for their good works, hard labor, perseverance, ability to discern good from evil, and for calling out false teaching, and for enduring hardship for his name's sake. Yet the Lord tells them that he has something against them. He said, you have left your first love. <laughs> when I read this, I realized that I had done this very thing. And like many Christians do, the Ephesians served and served and served until it was more about serving and less about who they were serving and why. Jesus told them, you have left your first love. 
This word left, ephemi in the Greek, it is used in a context connected with divorce. That really spoke to me. Got me thinking. Here is a statement from a ministry called Institute of Basic Life Principles. When a person receives Christ as his savior, he experiences the delight of first love for the Lord. God's spirit witnesses with his spirit that he is a child of God. And this newfound relationship brings great joy and freedom. We find this truth in Romans 8.16 where it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Unfortunately, many Christians fall away from this first love. This happens when a believer does not depend on God to meet his daily needs and his love for God grows cold. So what's Christ do? He instructs this church, and I think he's instructing anybody that's connecting with this message. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Recalling your salvation experience and your first love for the Lord can help you recognize changes that have developed in your relationship with God since then. Do you have a greater or weaker sense of your need for God now? Are you cooler towards God and less passionate about spiritual things than you once were? If so, repent of your indifference towards God. And repentance <laughs> involves a change of mind, heart, and direction. Forsake the thoughts, attitudes, and actions that have drawn your attention away from a wholehearted love for God. Receive God's forgiveness and renew your commitment to do the first works of your faith. And what are these first works? Worship. I remember in the beginning, it was different than it is now. We just, we're, we're in worship. We just worshiped. In the beginning, I had a passionate, fervent worship. And I have to admit, it just, it's not the same. I, I want that back. Prayer. I spent many times literally on my face. We, we used to have prayer sessions where we came here, and I laid on my face with Pastor Jim Pagan down there praying fervently for things. I haven't done that in years. Bible study. I used to be in the Word constantly in the Greek and the Hebrew translations and preparing Bible studies and teaching Bible studies. I've gotten away from that. In giving, in giving of yourself to others and I went on mission trips and experienced so many awesome things and, and gave myself there in fasting. And in fasting doesn't have to be about fasting from food. Right now I'm on a Facebook fast and I'm trying to be on a media fast. I think that's a, a needed thing occasionally because we can become so consumed with that negativity. And service to others, which is what we all know so well the trenches, over and over, week after week, just serving and serving and serving. But don't let it be mundane. Don't let it become a dull thing. Don't let it be something you have to do. Let it be something that you get to do. In my testimony, I shared that I have questioned my faith. So I would like to take a few minutes to talk about faith. I have found when examining one's faith we must ask ourselves, what is the foundation of our faith? And do we have anything propping up our faith? What do I mean by that? Have you ever heard someone say, if you just have enough faith, God will answer your prayers? Or if God hasn't answered your prayer, maybe you need more faith? Of course, we all have heard and seen God answering prayers. So that is not the point that I'm trying to make. But if the foundation of our faith in God is dependent upon how much faith we have, then we believe that having a particular amount of faith influences whether God will answer our prayers. Let me read that again because that is a powerful statement. 
if the foundation of our faith is dependent upon how much faith we have, then we will, then we will believe having a particular amount of faith influences whether God will answer our prayers or not. We need to understand there is a difference between faith in God and hoping that he will do what we want or think that he should do. This can lead to thinking that if we just have enough faith, then we can get God to do what we want him to do. This type of thinking can be dangerous because if we pray and God doesn't do what we were hoping he would, then we may start to lose faith. And if this happens, we must ask ourselves, is there something propping up our faith? It is important to know if we have something propping up our faith, because if it moves, then our faith will start to crumble, causing us to lose faith. There are many things that can undermine our faith, but I would like to just touch on one today, and it is unexplained circumstances. I just would start by saying that that's what happened with me and Sean. <laughs> it's an unexplained circumstance. Un unexplained circumstances can have the potential to erode an individual's faith that was probably already resting on an unstable foundation. How can unexplainable circumstances do that, we might ask? You prayed for a marriage to be restored, but it ended in divorce. You prayed that God would open up a job opportunity, but the job never came. You prayed for a healing, and it never happened. You prayed protection over a loved one, but God still took them. The list goes on and on and on. You prayed and you expected God to do something and he didn't. This is circumstantial faith. Because God didn't do what you expected him to do, your faith is impacted in a negative way. You were always told that if you do A, B, and C, God's going to do D, E, and F, right? I did my part. God didn't do his. It must mean that either there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with God. I didn't pray right or I don't have enough faith. I'm not good enough. God doesn't really love me. Or maybe God isn't able to do what I thought that he could do. If this is the case, then I am trusting in God and believing in him based on my ability to find him in my circumstances through what I see, feel, or expect him to do. When he is doing what I expect, my faith is strong. And when he doesn't do what I expect, my faith is shattered. This is an example of faith being propped up by circumstances, and that kind of faith will fail. This leads us to the Hebrews 4 scripture that Barb read earlier. And this is where we find the foundation of our faith. We have a high priest in history who came to this earth. He walked with ordinary people like you and I. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He performed many miracles. He faced every struggle that we face every day. He was beaten and tortured. He went to the cross. He died a death that we deserve, taking on the sins of the world so that we would have the door of reconciliation open that leads to God the Father. He was raised from the dead. He was seen by over 500 witnesses. He ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf in every situation, no matter how big or how small. He is not only able to sympathize with our struggles, but also empathize 
because he endured everything that we will ever face and overcame them all. So if you are being tempted, remember that in the wilderness, Jesus was tempted in every way by the devil for 40 days, yet overcame. If you have anxiety, remember Jesus sweated blood while he was agonizing in the garden of Gethsemane. If you are feeling far from God, remember that on the cross, Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? It's not in a circumstance. It's not in a prayer. It's not in a feeling. The foundation of our faith is in a person. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? Amen. I have decided to return to my first love. Who will come with me? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know your spirit's here today. We know that you've spoken to some hearts, and maybe some are confused, and maybe others don't even know you at all. I pray in the name of Jesus that this message would ring true to each heart, that they would have an ear to hear, and that you would speak to them right where they're at in their special place. I pray, Lord God, for those who are feeling weak and defeated, that you would revive them, that you would lift them up, that you would draw them closer to you. For those, Lord, that, that have been serving you for years and years, may they be revived and feel that first love again. Maybe there's some here that are experiencing that first love and they're in the midst of it. I pray that they would hold tightly onto it and you would give them the ability to do that, coming against every form of evil that tries to destroy it. For those, Lord, that don't know you at all, I pray in Jesus' name that this day they would bend their knee to you and they would confess you as Lord and they would invite you into their heart and that they would invite you into their lives, asking you to forgive them, asking you to take over their lives as they surrender it to you, that they may experience this love that you have for them, this awesome thing that you've given us all, grace and mercy, this thing that you've given us, forgiveness and the ability to love others and forgive others and to, to reach beyond our own failures in the flesh and to hold tightly to the Holy Spirit that you want to fill each one of us with. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would fill us with that spirit now and that you would be in our hearts and in our minds. Watch over and protect us and guide us ever closer to you in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.